All right, good morning. If you have your Bibles, I'd like to invite you to turn with me to Jonah chapter 1. We're going to uh, do something. We finished up last week. Yes, was that last week? <laughs> I have my weeks mixed up. Last week we finished up uh, looking at uh, Timothy, right? And uh, today we're going to start a new character study looking at the book of Jonah. And um, I don't know about you, but I like reading biographies. Um, I have uh, a whole bunch of biographies that were written by Chuck Swindoll that I love to go through and read. And um, I like biographies. I have one that's like this thick on Walt Disney. I haven't read it yet, uh, but I'd like to read it sometime. I have it on audiobook. So, but I like biographies. And um, one of the best places to find biographies is in the Bible, right? And we're going to look at a little book in the Old Testament that often is used in the children's department. And most of the time when you hear about Jonah, it's always connected to the felt boards, when, well, at least when I was growing up, with Jonah and the whale, right? Can't use the word whale now because they say that's not right. But I remember when I was little, we heard about Jonah and the whale, right? And, um, well, we're going to look at Jonah over the next several weeks. And we're going to see how God can use our disobedience for his uh, benefit. And we're going to look at, ver at chapter 1 this week and um, talk about his disobedience. Now, first of all, I want to give some words of introduction to this book. And the first one is I want to ask, is Jonah real or is he not? There is a lot of uh, speculation that is um, that a lot of scholars have over whether the Jonah is a real life prophet or he is an allegory set up by the Jewish people to make a point. Um, I have to say that I think that he's a real person. And there's a couple of reasons for that. The first one is that he is mentioned in the Old Testament book of Second Kings. And so if you'll turn over just real quick, put your thumb in Jonah and turn to Second Kings chapter 14. Second Kings chapter 14. Second Kings chapter 14. Verse 25. And it says, um, He restored the border of Israel. Yeah. Um, from the entrance of Hamanath as far as the Sea of uh, Arabah, according to the word of the Lord, the God had, of Israel, which he had spoken through his servant Jonah, the son of Amatai, the prophet who was of Gath Hefer. And um, so if he was a prophet, then he probably wrote this book. I. I, I think that a lot of times the liberal scholar is trying to make so many uh, excuses of why we can't trust the Bible. You know, I, I think of like they try to go out of their way to explain to us, for instance, that the miracles of Jesus were not accurate or they weren't real. I remember reading about the feeding of the 5,000 and um, talking about them that uh, one scholar says, oh yeah, they uh, had all the, 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 the bread and the fish in, in a cave there. They had it all st stacked up as much as they needed in this cave. And Jesus would just stand in front of the cave and the disciples would hand the bread and the fish under his robe to him to make it look like he was multiplying the bread and the fish. See, there is a lot that we try to go to explain away the Bible. That is some of the most, uh, I don't know. But Jonah was a real man, and I'll tell you why, because this is a very 
probable story for someone who was very dedicated to the Jewish faith. Um, we also, another reason why he was real is because Jesus himself connects Jonah in his, in his ministry. And I would think that Jesus would know whether or not uh, Jonah was a real person, right? Because he was the Lord. And he would have been able to say, that's not real, but he doesn't question it. And so in Matthew chapter 12 and verse uh, 39, he talks about um, this man, Jonah. When he talks about three days and three nights, he says in verse 39, uh, they come to him and they want a sign from him. It says, um, but he answered and said to them, an evil and adulterous generation craves for a sign, and yet no sign will be given to it but the sign of Jonah the prophet. So if it looks here that, that Jesus believes that there was a guy named Jonah and that he was a prophet. He didn't question the credentials here. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the sea monster, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the earth. And the men of Nineveh shall stand up with this generation at the judgment and shall condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah and behold, something greater than Jonah is here. If, if he was talking about an allegory, he would not, because there wouldn't be no people of Nineveh to stand up in the end. He's not talking about some kind of person way off yon. He's not talking about a fable story. He's talking about real people who had a real prophet, and he's talking like it's a real thing. So if he's doing that, then we can come to the same conclusion uh, that Jonah was a real person, that this is a real story, and that it has real application to us today. Why? Because Jesus said so. And I'll go with Jesus on that. So back to Jonah. So we know that Jonah is true. It's not an allegory or a fable or a whatever you want to call it. It's a real story. Uh, the date of the writing, probably 782 B.C., I put a question mark because we're not sure. Again, we're guessing, but that's just kind of around uh, the time that he would have uh, wrote it. The theme of this book is to show that the God of the Hebrews has concern for other people outside of his, of his people. Jonah is, I call him a racist. I'll, I'll tell you that. He is a racist. He hates the Ninevites. He believes that they are the infidel. He has been hurt badly by them. Now, I want to give you just a little bit of information on uh, these Ninevites. They were a very savage people. They would do, uh, in war, they would uh, kill the women and the children. And if the children were pregnant, they would cut open the wombs of the children with swords and uh, dismember their kids in the womb. They were pretty mean. And they wreaked havoc for a while during Jeroboam the second on the the nation Israel. And so Jonah was very bitter. These people deserve to be sent to straight to, straight to Hades, straight to hell. Do not pass go. Do not collect two hundred dollars. And uh, God told him, He says, "I I love everybody." And Jonah says, "I don't care whether you love everybody or not. I'm not gonna go." And but the purpose of this book is to show us that God loves everybody. I think of the song that we sing in children's church, Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world, red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. And I will say that Jesus loves the big people of the world too. He loves every nation. And he doesn't have just one particular people that he likes. Yes, he likes uh, the nation Israel, but he was going to use them to reach out to all the nations. But they kind of got this pie-in-the-sky attitude that I'm better than everybody else, and that was Jonah. But you know what? I see that sometimes that I can act just like Jonah too. 
that I can think that I'm all that and a bag of chips and that uh, I get mad when God wants to bless someone else. And so that's what we see in this book of Jonah. Um, the key verse that I find for the book of Jonah is in Jonah chapter 4, verse 11. And it says, And should I not have compassion on Nineveh, the great city, which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know the difference between their right and their left hand, as well as many animals. God cares about other people. He even cares about animals. You know that? He loves, he loves our dogs. He loves our cats. And uh, I believe that. I have, a, I have a cat and two dogs at home. And I know that Jesus loves them too. But we look here at chapter 1. And chapter 1 talks about Jonah's original disobedience. And um, I've labeled this section in chapter 1, Jonah's disobedience shows Yahweh's uh, patience. Um, we serve a pretty good God that puts up with us. And he puts up with Jonah here too. And we see here, and I'm just going to read as we go along, but we see in verses 1 and 2, we have the order. He gives the order to, to Jonah. Verse 1. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise and go to Nineveh, the great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. Now, pretty straightforward. And you would think, okay, Lord... You want me to go and cry out against it, and I, I'll do it. But he doesn't want to do it because he knows God's going to be nice and forgive them if they repent. And Jonah doesn't want them to repent. Jonah wants them to burn. Have you ever had people that you're so bitterly mad and angry at that you don't want God to save them? You want them to just burn in hell all the time. You know, I, I want to say I'm not proud of it, but I've had those... Those people too, I've had to ask God to forgive me for that. But I've had those people that just get under your skin and you just want God to just defat fry them and make them like Kentucky Fried Chicken. Right? You just get so bitter because you've been hurt by them. And these people have been pestering Judah. They're evil people. They're, they're to, to Jonah the infidel. They're the evil people. He, he doesn't want to see them saved. But God, he has other people things in mind and so Jonah what does he do well that's the second thing the um, the uh, uh, we have the uh, let's see if I can read my own handwriting um, we have the um, the objection well I think I have doctor's handwriting the objection verse 3 but Jonah rose up to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. So he went down to the Joppa to found a ship to where, which he was going to Tarshish, paid the fare and went down into the goat of air to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Now you might think, well, don't you think God would follow him? You have to understand at this time they believed pretty heavily that God stayed in one place. That he dwelt in, in Israel. That if you would leave Israel. Then somehow you would be able to get away from him. And so Jonah thought. Well I'm just going to run away from God. Now we know of course that's not true. You can't run away from God. Uh, no matter how hard you try. God will get you. Uh, but Jonah he tries to run away from God. So he objects. And he goes and he gets into the ship. And he goes to Tarshish. And. And uh, then we have the ordeal. And oh, what an ordeal it is. Right? First of all, what does he do? What does God do? He sends a storm. Verse 4. And the Lord hurled a great wind on the sea. And there was a great storm on the sea that the ship was about to break up. Now, I believe that uh, 
not all the hardships that we go through in life God causes. I agree with that. But I will say that when we go our own way, God will use the hardships in our lives to get our attention. I know that God has used several hardships in my life to get my attention and to say, hey, you need to reevaluate your life. You need to reevaluate how you're living and uh, you need to check on how things are going. And um, so he, here's Jonah. He's going down and the Lord hear, hurled a great wind on the sea. And, and, and what happens? Well, he goes and he goes to sleep. Right? And uh, everybody else is afraid. Right? And uh, the ferocious storm. And then we have two things. A sailor attempt to... to to save the ship, and then they pl try to place blame. Verse 5, Then the sailors became afraid, and every man cried to his God, and they threw the cargo which was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone below into the hold of the ship, laying down and fallen asleep. Now, you would say, now why would he do that? Because running away from God takes work. <laughs> it, uh, it'll wear you out. It, it's not good. It'll, it'll wear you out. So he goes and he falls asleep. And uh, these people, they try to pray to their God. and They try to hurl things overboard. And uh, so then what do they do? They play... Uh, Throw the dice. Try to see whose fault it is. It must be someone's fault. Verse 6. So the captain approached him and said, How is it that you are sleeping? Get up, call on your God. Perhaps your God will be concerned about us that we will not perish. And each man said to his mate, Come, let us cast lots so that we may learn on whose account this calamity has struck us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. Now, I don't know their idea of casting lots, but I will say this, that in this particular situation, God's hand was in that lot. And uh, he made sure that Jonah was going to be the big winner that day. And that's one of the times you don't want to win at dice. Um, there's other times when probably people want to win at dice, I don't recommend playing dice, but um, but here he tried to play dice and he lost. And they asked him, what's up? And he knew what was up. He knew that he was running away from God. And so what does he do? Well, he confesses in verse 8, right? They said to him, tell us. Now, on whose account has this calamity struck us? What is your occupation and where do you come from? What is your country? From what people are you? So he confessed. And he said, I am a Hebrew and I fear the Lord, God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. So he confesses. Right? They confront him. He confesses. And then... Um, the men became extremely frightened and they said to him, How can you do this? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. So they said to him, What should we do? That the sea may become calm for us. For the sea was becoming increasingly stormy. Now here's the thing. He could have told them. He says, You know what? Could you guys take me to Nineveh? He still does not want to go. He would rather die than obey God. Have you ever been that bitter at God that you would rather die than do what He asked you to do? Or if your mom ever asked you to do something and you just didn't want to do it? And you'd rather get whipped by your dad than do what you're told? I wouldn't, but uh, my brother used to, well, he used to always tell me that if I started crying, my mom would stop spanking us but um, but here he was so stubborn with God so stubborn I'll, I'll, I'll die throw me into the sea 
and it'll stop. Right? So he says, verse 14. Now these men here, they don't want God to, 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 to count them wrong. Verse 14. Right? So they tried to get back to land. Verse 13. Right? They, the men rode desperately to return to land, but they could not, for the sea was becoming even stormier against them. And so then they called on the Lord and said, We earnestly pray, O Lord, do not let us perish on account of this man's life. And do not put innocent blood on us, for thou, O Lord, hast done as thou hast pleased. So what do they do? Verse 15, So they picked up Jonah, threw him into the sea, and the sea stopped its raging. Then the men feared the Lord greatly, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. Now you would think that it says, now Jonah died. That's the end, right? No. God's going, I'm not done with you yet. You can't run from me. <laughs> Verse 17, And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the stomach of the fish three days and three nights. And we look at this story and we go, okay, I get it, I can be disobedient, but how can I apply this? And I want to just spend some time and talk about application. I think there's four things we can take from this passage. The first one is this, that it is impossible to think that we can run from God. I can sit here and tell you my story and my own experience of trying to run from God. My friends, let me tell you, you can't go anywhere to run from God. People think that they can move away. People think that they can get as far away from God as possible. But guess what? You cannot run from Him. Why? God is omnipresent. He is everywhere. Jonah found that out the hard way. One of my favorite psalms in all the Bible, Psalm 139, says it this way. And I love the way that it says this. Help if I go the right place. Psalm 139 says this. Where can I go from thy spirit? Or where can I flee from thy presence? If I ascend into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in Sheol, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the dawn, if I dwell in the uttermost part of the sea, even there thy hand will lead me, and thy right hand will lay hold of me. If I say, surely the darkness will overtake me, or overwhelm me, and the light around me will be night. Even the darkness is not dark to thee. And the night is as bright as the day. Darkness and light are alike to thee. Here's what God's saying. You can go as high up in the heavens you can. And I'm right there with you. You can go as deep as, as the grave or she hole or hell. And I'm right there. You can't get rid of me. You can go as far in the east as you can. Right off into the sunset. But you can't get rid of God. You can try to hide from God in the deepest, darkest cave. But guess what? He's still there. Here's the, here's the response. It is stupid to try to run from God. But why do we do it? I'll tell you why we do it. We are stupid, stubborn people. Can I say that? I will, because we are. I know I've been there. And I look back on my life and go, wow, did I really make those kind of dumb choices? You know, we talked about it in Sunday school. Paul, he fought God. And, he t and, and God told him, are you fighting against the goads, the sticks? The prompting of the Holy Spirit. 
You cannot run from God. God will get you. And we're going to see next time in chapter 2 that God reaches Jonah from the belly of the great fish. I really like the New Testament's rendering of that, the great sea monster. And if you want my opinion, I think that he was uh, swallowed up by, um, in my opinion, a dinosaur. I, I do. You can probably have me taken away as a crazy person, but those guys are huge. Job said he saw those type of creatures, and they could have been, but it was a, it was a fish that was appointed for Jonah. God made it especially for him. But you can't run from him. I don't care. You may be trying to run from God today and just trying to run, 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 run. I, good luck to you on that. He will hunt you down. Number two. Our disobedience not only affects us, but also those around us. I think of the sailors in this story. Oh, the sailors. They didn't need to be in this storm. They didn't need to be a part of this story. Jonah wasn't thinking a bit about them. He was only thinking about himself. And you know the sad thing that I've heard a lot of people when they're disobeying God and they're in drugs and alcohol and all sorts of things is they think, I'm only hurting myself. People that do drugs and alcohol are like that. I'm only hurting myself. It's only my body that I'm hurting. No, you're not. Our sins and the choices that we make make ripple effects in the waters of life. Our choices affect those around us. They affected these men. Which leads me to my third point. That God can use our disobedience to bring others closer to Him. These sailors at the beginning of the story were pagan sailors. And by the end of the story, they were God-feeling proselytes. What does that mean? They now believed in Yahweh. They now were brought into the Hebrew family because of all this. Isn't that awesome? God can use our mistakes and our stupidity and our bad choices to bring other people to Him. They pray and say, God, don't cause us this way. So what happened? They throw them overboard, right? And in verse 16, Then the men feared the Lord greatly. And they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. Now, according to Dr. Ron Ron Allen, professor of Old Testament at Dallas Theological Seminary, he makes a distinction to say that at the beginning of Jonah, he calls, and all their references to uh, any deity is gods with a small g. Do you notice that? If you look in verse 5, it says, Then the sailors became afraid, and every man cried to his God, lowercase g, and they threw the cargo which is in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone below. And then verse 6. So the, so the captain approached him and said, how, how is it that you are sleeping? Get up, call on your God, perhaps your God will be concerned about us so that we will not perish. Hold on just a second. I have a new translation that I'm breaking in. Hopefully here in, over the next week or so I'll be using it more. But it's the LSB and I really like it because it, it shows us how the, the word of, of the Lord is translated. And they translate it as Yahweh. And it is extremely helpful to us in this section. The LSB is the Legacy Standard Bible. It is the update of the the NSAB, the New American Standard, uh, that they try to make it more helpful and easier for us to understand. Now notice this. Let me read it out of the LSB. Verse 5. Then the sailors became fearful. 
And every man cried to his God, same thing before, and they hurled the cargo which was in the ship into the sea to lighten the load for them. And then I'm going to drop down to verse 6. Arise, call on your God. Perhaps your God will be concerned about us so that we will not perish. And then if you'll drop down to verse 16. Then the men greatly feared Yahweh. Ah, praise God. And they offered a sacrifice to Yahweh and made vows. Now I want you to notice something. All the commentators agree they didn't do it on the ship. It stopped raging. So do you know where they went? They went to Jerusalem. They went to the temple and they made a vow. They became believers in Yahweh. They were intentional about their faith. Here's what God can do with, with people like us and make mistakes and fall away. He can turn that into salvation. Praise God. And number four. God is willing um, to... Uh, God is willing to do whatever it takes to get us to obey Him. God would not allow Jonah to take his life. I love that. Verse 17, And Yahweh appointed a great fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the stomach of the fish three days and three nights. My friends, I want to tell you the type of God we serve today. He's not a mean and vengeful God. See, the Old Testament, people think, well, I don't like the God of the Old Testament because He's a vengeful, wrathful God. I like the God of the New Testament. He's a loving and caring God. And every time people say that, I scratch my head. And I go, why? It's the same God. The same God of the loving, caring God is still in the Old Testament. Why? He could have let Jonah drown. But he didn't. Why? He cared for him. He loved him. He cared for Nineveh. He loved them. Why do I, 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 I think of this? Well, I, I think of it th for this reason. We are living in a day and age that we have to really watch how we operate in the world. I hope that we never will disobey God. <laughs> but maybe there are people that are listening to this message and I just, you know, my heart, I also have to preach not only to you here but also to those on the other camera. I don't know what you're going on in your life. I don't know what you're running away from. I don't know what you are doing in your heart with the Lord. But may I say that God will never stop giving you an opportunity to hear the gospel message. Now I believe that our hearts can become so hard that we don't hear Him, but that doesn't mean that God is not here talking to us. God will go at any lengths to bring us into obedience with us, even if it means to make a fish swallow us up. But here's, here's my point. Don't be like Jonah. Don't think that you're better than everybody else. I don't. You know, and that's something that I have a tendency as a Christian to do is I have a tendency as a Christian to think that I'm better than the people that aren't Christians. Lord, help me. Lord, help me. I'll give you a great example of this and then I'll close. We did a funeral yesterday for um, um, Diane's grandson. And we got done and we were thirsty and so we went to Circle K to go get a drink and we went there and there was a lady that I, we, me and Autumn had been trying to talk to her name is um, Chelsea and um, told her we were tired we just got done from a funeral she says yeah I know 
I said, really, you know? She said, yeah. I'm Curtis's step sister. I was there. Want to know something? I never saw her here. I was so focused in my world and what I had to do that I didn't even think to see. I should have recognized who she was. I saw her every day at the store. But you know what? We have a tendency to think that way. Lord, help me. <laughs> I had to ask God for forgiveness. Lord, help me to see the people outside that when they come in that I recognize who they are and I'm not so tunnel visioned that I'm only seeing what I have to do. Help me to see the people. I didn't run away like Jonah did, but boy, I could become just as racist and just as hard-nosed as Jonah to where I don't care about anyone else. I don't care about the Ninevites. I don't care about the sailors. I just care about me and my own self. Lord, help me that I don't care about the people around me. May we not be like Jonah. That we get so caught up in doing church. <laughs> that we forget about being the church. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for Jonah. I'm thankful that these biographies that you put in the Bible are meant to teach us on what not to do. And I really believe in my heart that, that Jonah did repent at the end of his life and I bet he was sorry that he had ran from God and this is his story And I just pray, Lord, that you would help us as Christians to not get so self-righteous and think that, that those around us are not worthy of being saved or that we get so caught up with doing our own thing that we forget those around us. Father, help us to be sensitive to the world around us. Help us to see the people around us and to recognize them Father, forgive me that I got so caught up in doing the funeral that I, I missed someone that I had been sharing my faith with at the, at the convenience store. Father, give us open hearts that we won't just do church, but we would be church. Always keep us sensitive to the nudging and the moving of the Holy Spirit. Please help us in this, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.